hyperspaces and tech shops. Because, like, in the U.S. right now, it's dismal. Like, oh, kids yeah. are not learning anything, right. and the parents want to take them to hyperspaces no to learn. No machine shops in school. There's no machine shops. You can't do anything. So what I think we, mo we might ultimately see is someone who comes along and takes all the goodness of, like, the Arduino stuff right. and does Khan Academy-style learning with something like the Arduino. Because you really need a really simple programming language. It, language. it might be something like Scratch, like a project from MIT. Right. But how do you teach kids programming? This is a big, a big problem. Sure. And no one's tackled it. Like, Khan Academy is working on the traditional subjects, I think, like what Moore saying. But someone will come along, and they will teach electronics. And if you look what's happened, like, everyone here has probably learned more from tinkering around with an Arduino than any other, any other way to learn electronics. Because if you start out learning electronics, it takes you weeks, maybe even months, before you can blink an LED. Where if you get an Arduino, you can do it by the end of the night. So I think there is going to be a combination of two. No one, no one, no one has cracked this yet, and no one has solved it. But I think in the end, it'll be something similar to Khan Academy, or even something like there's a cool site called Memrise, where you can learn like another language really fast, and they they, they constantly quiz you, they constantly test you. It's on iPad, it's on like every weird way that that people are now learning stuff. Sure. So I think. I think it's going to happen, but I don't. I don't. It, I, don't I don't know how it's going to happen yet. It's, it's, uh, my personal okay, experience. Well, oh, I think. Uh, so he has a question. Too. Well, right, well, if I could just say something, I feel like maybe I'm on the other side of this thing because I go to a small private high school in St. Louis, Missouri, with a graduating class of about 70, and we have a fairly limited course selection. There's really no way to get hands-on with electronics and machine shops and things like that. So. This summer, I basically had to fly to California to find a place where I could do that, and that's really what I wanted to do for eight weeks. So I took a course at Stanford for college credit, and it was called Interactive Device Design. So I actually got to get hands-on with an Arduino-based uh, yeah. chip, and that was the first thing we did. We, it was called Blink, and in about, uh, we did one class, which was a lecture, and then I had built that. And I wasn't really super excited about programming, but because I was driven, like you were saying, by wanting to do something, I kind of forced myself to learn it. And by the end, I had done a whole MP3 player, and I think that would be so great if there was a way I could do that even earlier, because I think even some of my classmates now only have the motivation but the skill to do it. And so I, I just thought I'd say that, but that's really something that would be so beneficial if you know, kids like me could get at that. Yeah. And th there's one big challenge. Did you get that? Did you get that? <laughs> yeah, there's one, there's, there's one big challenge, and, and this is just kind of a side side note that I always talk about at conferences or, or even in articles now. So documentation still sucks for um, learning. So Instructables is one way to do it. Wikis are another. And um, the folks from iFixit, they're releasing an open standard called Omanual. And you'll eventually be able to have a system where you can share step-by-step -step tutorials. Can you believe, like, we can share almost anything. There's RSS feeds, there's Twitter, there's everything. But if you publish a tutorial online, like, you're stuck. Whatever you put into like, this HTML, like, you can't actually transfer it over. It doesn't turn into an iPad. It's very yeah. difficult to do. You can do recipes, sort of. But we don't have ways to share step-by-step -step tutorials. And that's what we need for electronics. There's no, uh, Instructables is really close, but they just got acquired by Autodesk. And so, mm. what's oh, next? Oh, that's right. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. What's next? You need to start recipe. What? So you need to start a recipe. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, actually, yeah. So the iFixit thing is like they're uh, they're they're charging quite a bit of money. For their for their they will. Service. Yeah. So it's like kind of when I saw that, I'm like, uh, it's like, yeah. It's, and and yeah. for us who for a living, we basically release tutorials. No. Um, we have to. There, we don't publish in a standard format. There's no standard like how to an XML. Like there's no there's no way that I can distribute and share these in easy ways. And even make, because I was on the other side of make and the publishing side, you use old tools like Quark Express. I think you can Quark yeah, Express. Like, or, or the new yeah, InDesign yeah. is another yeah. one. Oh, InDesign's awesome. And so it's really difficult to, to, if you do it in print, it's hard to do it anywhere else. You have to kind of remake your content over and over. Mm -hmm. So eventually, I think, just to get back to that, like it, it, one of the biggest problems with electronics is uh, teaching it and documentation. Yeah. yeah. Well, documentation, yeah, I think uh, that's, that's historically, Technology, I think documentation is a big issue. It's hard. Yeah. Mm. It takes longer than actually doing mm. engineering. Yeah, yeah and the engineers don't want to do it. It requires different talent. Here's an easy proof that they yeah. don't have the space here. To do it. <laughs> 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 but you guys are doing Geiger counters, and like, you know what? Like, as long as you guys are keep doing it, it'll be fine. But 
how can you share that information with other people? Oh no, we, we uh, actually we open source the design, and then uh, also the software was written by Shigeru Kobayashi. So like, uh, so we're using his software, and then so that was like his whole uh, open source hardware or something. Uh, discussion. No, but I mean like they're remaking one. Let's say there's another problem somewhere else in the world. Like, how do you like? What's the step by step documentation? Like? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's kind of a cool point because I saw they have, I think, is it three prototypes right now of the iPhone bagger counter? Device? Oh, dude, we have we have like we have like uh, maybe I think around roughly ten versions of different bagger counters just floating around. Yeah. So we're we have three of them that are just like kind of deployed, and then so the i the i gaigi, the net red, n gaigi, b gaigi, i gaigi, net red. And each one has its own generations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, we have like the classic. Just yes. like whatever communications <laughs> format you prefer is like you know we have a bagger counter for you. It's like a, but uh, yeah, it, that's the problem. Is like we so for oh man we're like skipping the, the safecast part. But for safecast is not. It was uh, <laughs> yeah we when when Fukushima was blowing up we didn't have like time to really yeah. think about like you know that we were just like all right you know get get get. Get some Geiger tubes, get a high voltage supply, and let's start making Geiger counters. Because that's how innovation happens, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> you can tell <laughs> how short our development cycle is. We had the big classic. There's, there's probably a, a tie back here to the open source thing because if there's people who really do want to take their iPhones around and get uh, Geiger counter readings, that I, you showed me at lunch today the iGuide, which is a whole lot of engineering, but a fairly straightforward device actually on a breadboard that yeah. people might be able to make themselves. And, like you said, it multiplies. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Makes their product in Shihar, the AWP makes their product in your company, your place. And is it good? Yes. Yes. Uh, what do you think about open, open source hardware and mass production? The, the, the tools or the item itself? How do, how do you make it? Cash flow? Oh, okay. Just the background. So, she, right? so oh, uh, we talked to her. Yeah. Oh, 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 all right. Hey, you don't need me now. You know, you're like, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be in the back. Okay. Um, what, so, one thing you can do is um, if you're starting out and you're not sure, you know, you don't, you don't have to open source something. You don't have to. You can say, I will open source it six months from now because you know you, you don't have time to document it or maybe you're nervous and you're, this is your starting. Um, th that's fine. You know, nobody is forcing anyone to do open source hardware. Um, but uh, it's, it's not um, as big of a problem as you might think because uh, anyone who would be uh, copying your hardware it's good enough to look at it and and uh, reverse engineer it from just looking. Because there's, uh, you know, like we took the uh, Roland 303, uh, we, we just opened it up. We bought one and we just opened it and then it took us like, a week, but we traced every component. And so we didn't need to have a schematic. We just made our own. So it, it, if you uh, do open source hardware, you're, um, think of it as a way of um, rewarding your customers and not as a way of punishing yourself. Uh, she she want to know about the uh, the cash flow. The first thing uh, you want when you get the when you make the product on the production line, mm -hmm. you have to uh, get thin stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do you get the, the first cash? To oh, get oh, the oh stuff? I thought she meant I meant uh, she meant long. <coughs> um, for initial, um, you can do very small runs. So um, it, you can get, you know, PCBs for, you know, any amount basically for two hundred fifty dollars, twenty five, two thousand five hundred, whatever, two hundred fifty dollars, and then you can buy small quantities of components. There, there is always some financial risk because when you buy components, you have to buy components, and to get good prices, you have to buy one hundred. So one thing is you can have a hacker space, and you can go in with a bunch of people. Say, hey, I'm getting like Geiger counter tubes. Buying one Geiger counter tube costs $20. But buying 100 Geiger counter tubes, maybe it's $5. And then you split it. 
with like your friends. So that's one like one thing you can do to start. Um, there is one more new thing that's happening in the U.S. right now. I don't know if it's hit Japan. Is there something called Kickstarter? So yeah. for cash flow, people <laughs> yeah. So what people do is <laughs> yeah, okay yeah. I have the same watch. Yeah. So uh, for cash flow, they'll use Kickstarter. They'll say, here's what we want to make, and here how here's how much it costs. And if you want to participate at this level, you get one of them. Or if you just want to contribute because you like me, you get one of them. Or if you want to do something like that. And so we're starting to see that you can get funding from friends or family or VC or whatever. You can um, invest your own money in a short run, like more said. And then this next new thing is Kickstarter, where you can almost pre-sell it to people. And if you have a really good idea, like. You know, any of the projects that I usually see that are great um, at Hacker Spaces, or people send them to make now, it's like people want to buy them. And so Kickstarter allows them to participate, even though they'll, they'll never do engineering or anything else, they feel like they could still be part of it. So it's very powerful. So I don't know if there's something like this here. And if there isn't something like this here, someone in this room should go do a <laughs> Japanese version of Kickstarter. <laughs> Peter, you want to tell yeah. how safecast.org got started? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we use Kickstarter for, for a bunch of Wagyu companies uh, yeah. to be shipped out. So in Japan, the, the whole idea of Kickstarter is very, very new. Yeah. And we did it for safecast. We got lots of questions. What is Kickstarter? There was actually lots of interest in that. Yeah. But I think that the Japanese sense of risk perverseness is very, very strong. Yeah. That's why there's also a capital venture. Uh, venture capital in Japan also yeah, exists. Yeah, yeah. So these type of ideas work very well in the US where people say, oh, I can take a risk or whatever. In Japan, it's like, oh my god, you know, I'm taking a risk. Yeah. So there, there is a cultural... Actually, oh my god, I'm not taking a risk. Right, we're not taking a risk. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh my god, I'm going to give money to somebody I don't know. Yeah. So, uh, there's, there's also a little cultural um, bias towards just random and donating money, you know? Yeah. Um, when you see people collecting money in front of train stations for previous earthquakes, you don't see a whole lot of people putting money into those boxes. So you see them working really hard for getting small donations. That's just a cultural thing. In Japan too. So the idea of Kickstarter is, is not only that it's new; it's that it's a very unusual concept. Please forgive me, I'm funny, but my son yeah. has gone to sleep, and I'm going to stop shooting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, uh, so if, if I were to add something for total, totally, you just do, uh, yeah, just do do your designs, do small runs, and then see if they sell. So the most important thing initially is just. Making sure that there's a market for what you have. Another thing, if you can price it so that you know what it would cost for a hundred, and then you you personally say, okay, th I know that say you want to make something and it's uh, five dollars, five hundred yen in components, and um, so you say, okay, well, if it's five hundred yen, I want to sell it for two thousand yen in the stores. So you're going to sell it to the store for a thousand yen, and then they sell it for two thousand. Because that's how you have to you have to double the money twice. So then you might say, um, you can work like, you know, with the store or something, or you can just say, okay, I know that eventually the cost will be 500 yen, but for the first 25 pieces, I'm going to eat it. I'm going to sink my money in just to figure out if this is true. So, you know, the components, again, the prices go down at 100. So maybe for the first 10, you just say, okay, I'm going to buy... Ten of these with some of my friends, and it's it's twice as much as it should be, but at least they'll know whether it's a good idea, and that way you're not you're not making money, you're not losing money, but at least you're running whether it's a good idea. 